my Retroid Pocket 4 Pro just arrived, and I gotta say I am more excited about this than I was with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This brings a lot of welcomed improvements that we've been desperately in need of. This handheld overall has blown past a lot of my expectations. In a way, this feels very similar to what the Odin feels like, but in a much smaller package, and I think this is going to be one of the best handhelds for a good while. If you're in the market and you're looking for a brand new handheld, let me tell you a little bit about the Retro Pocket 4 Pro. This new unit from Retroid brings a huge generational improvement over the previous 3 Plus, and if you've been waiting for a time to get one of these handhelds, I think now's the time. Let me walk you through a little bit about why I think this handheld is really special and what about it I really like. Starting things off, let's take a closer look at their website. So they have two different models this time. They have the D900, which is matching the Odin Light in performance. They also have the new Retroid Pocket 4 Pro that comes with the Dimensity 1100. There's a $50 difference between these two, but from what I've seen so far, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is the one to get in my opinion. I got the watermelon color, and I think it looks absolutely fantastic, but I'll take a closer look at the coloring in a bit. They also have a few add-ons this time around, and if you are using this for streaming or playing more modern games, I do recommend picking up this grip. The case also looks very similar to what the Retroid Pocket 2S case looked like, and I did order one, but I don't have that quite yet. On the Pro model, we do get 8 gigs of RAM. The base RP4 model only comes with 4 gigs of RAM. Both of these have 128 gigs of that internal storage on them, but the RP4 Pro is running Android 13. The RP4 is only running Android 11. This also comes with Hall sticks, and we have analog triggers now. This unit has also been upgraded to Wi-Fi 6. If we take a closer look at the difference between the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, there is a huge generational improvement here. If we're looking at general overall performance, we're looking at around 178% faster overall. CPU wise, we're looking at around 136% uplift in single thread and 130 in multi-core threaded performance. The biggest improvement though comes from the GPU. If we're looking at general compute performance, we're looking at upwards of 400% nearly. And the Vulkan test from what I've seen from other reviewers is absolutely astounding. It looks like Nano Review doesn't have a Vulkan test for 3D Mark on the T618. This new chip is also way more efficient, being manufactured on 6 nanometer tech, as opposed to the 12 nanometer technology found on the T618. On the T618, we're looking at a raw GPU performance of around 81 gigaflops. However, on the Dimensity 1100, that's almost up to one teraflop. This is a massive improvement between these two chips. This is by far one of the biggest generational improvements we've seen between models on a handheld. This is not to say that the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or the 2S is a bad handheld by any means, but the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is definitely a generational improvement over the previous models. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro and the Retroid Pocket 4 both come in the same box that we've seen from Retroid previously. If you haven't been able to tell, I love the color red, so I opted for the watermelon. One of the only other things that came with my review model was this user manual. This has a quick overview of the handheld and all the different specifications. The last thing in the box is a charging cable. This is black now instead of the typical Retroid white, and there's also some branding on there now too. My first look at the console, I was really impressed. This thing looks incredible, and out of all the handhelds that I've tried, I think they really nailed this red. I do have a few other red handhelds that we can compare this to, but overall I think that the shell looks absolutely incredible. It has a very subtle texture to it as well, which makes it very comfortable to hold, and this also helps resist fingerprints. If you watch my channel a lot, you're going to notice that this shell is a very similar red to the FPGA Game Boy Color. This is almost a one-to-one -one match with the Pokemon Ruby cartridges. So if you were a Pokemon Ruby fan and you love that color, I definitely think you're going to be impressed with the shell. The new Watermelon color is also very similar to my Extreme Rate Joy-Con shells for my Switch OLED. First things first, let's take a closer look at the size. This is almost exactly the same size as the original Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. 
The new face buttons sit at 7.2 millimeters. These are slightly bigger than the old face buttons, and those come in at 6.7 millimeters. This isn't a huge difference, but you definitely notice these are a little bit bigger and it does help with your gaming experience. If you like the D-pad on the old 3 Plus, you're going to be very happy to find this is exactly the same D-pad on this new model. We do have a couple of design changes though, and those are pretty relevant. The start and select has been moved to the front corner at the bottom right. We now also have a back and home button for Android, as well as getting some upgrades to the face buttons. Both of the face buttons are rubber membrane though, and they do feel very similar. The only noticeable difference is that the new RP4 Pro doesn't take as much force to push down. Another welcome improvement is these new joysticks. They have an anti-friction ring around the outside, but they do sit much taller than the previous model. These are exactly the same joysticks as we see on the Odin 2 and on the Retro Pocket 2S. On the Retro Pocket 3 Plus, these joysticks are 3.8mm tall. On the new Retro Pocket 4, these stick out to 5.2mm. On the top of the device, we have our two bumpers and the two triggers, as well as a power button and some volume buttons. We also have a pretty large fan vent and an HDMI out. They're also slightly flared at the bottom and I really do like that. This kind of reminds me of how the triggers are on the iNeo Air. These triggers and bumpers also have a slight texture to them. This texture actually reminds me a lot of the ROG Ally. You can also see quite a range on these. The bumpers are very clicky and the triggers are very smooth. If we look at these triggers from the side, you're going to see just how much range these things have. You can also see that flare on the bottom there. But yeah, overall, I think these are awesome triggers. If we compare these to the old Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, you're going to see these ones were very small. These were also just digital triggers, so we didn't have a range on them either. Another difference you're going to notice is that they had the volume buttons on the side. I did see a couple people mention that they pressed these accidentally, so this is nice to see this on the top now. Now that we've looked at some of the differences between these two devices, let's talk about the size itself. I would say this feels very similar to what it feels like putting a cell phone in your pocket. If your cell phone fits in your pocket, you're not going to have any issues with the portability of this device. This is also kind of where I feel like this device starts to get a little different from the competition because a lot of the competition is way bigger or way smaller. Let's start things off with the smallest device that I own, the Retroid Pocket 2S. This feels way smaller to use as the screen is much smaller obviously. If we line up the screens perfectly centered you're going to see just how small this thing is compared to the 3 Plus. There's around 14 millimeters on each side, but the Retroid Pocket 2S is much taller. Both of these devices are still extremely pocketable though. Let's take a closer look at one of their other devices. I do think that the flip is a little less pocketable. This is way thicker, so you're going to notice this when it's in your pocket. A nice thing about the flip form factor though is that this folds out to being a much bigger handheld. The screen is exactly the same size. But you do have all these controls on the bottom, so there's a lot less on the sides. Stepping things up one size, I really was hoping this is kind of where the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro was going to be. I do think that this screen size and the joystick placement is a little bit better suited for modern gaming. But this is just a personal preference, so I know a lot of people have been very happy with the portability size of the Retroid Pocket 3, so they're going to be pretty happy here. The screen size is quite a noticeable jump. These two devices also feel very similar in thickness. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is going to be ever so slightly thicker just because of these flared triggers, but I do think that's a really welcome improvement as I'm not a fan of the triggers on the Switch Lite. Next up is the Odin 2 and this thing completely dwarfs the Retroid Pocket 4. This is actually kind of where I start to find these devices not being pocketable. The Switch Lite, because it is a little bit thinner, is going to still be able to fit in your pocket. But the Odin 2 is just simply too big. In my TomTalk bag, this actually replaces the slot where my X86 devices would go. But the Retroid Pocket 4 is so thin that I could fit this in the front and have an X86 device in the back. If I wanted to take two devices with me, I simply couldn't take my Odin and my Ally in the same bag. 
but if I wanted to take my ally, I could take my ally and fit the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro in the bag as well. If we look at the top of these two devices, you're going to notice the placement looks identical. We have the HDMI, followed by the fan, then the volume, then the power button. I do think that these bumpers and triggers are similar in size to what we see on an x86 device, so this is almost too big for a lot of people. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro though is still maintaining that slim size while being pocketable. You're going to notice though that both of these devices have flared triggers, and I really like that on a device. Both of these remind me of the iNeo Air, and out of all the handhelds that I've tried, that one has the nicest triggers. I do think however that the Air almost has too much travel on its triggers, and both of these devices fix that. This is a decent amount of travel while not being too much. And the bumper size is nice on both. I do like the texture on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro triggers and bumpers better as compared to the Odin's smooth triggers and smooth bumpers. If we take a look at the smallest x86 handheld that I own, the iNeo Air Pro, this thing is definitely a little bigger. I like to line up the screens dead center like this so you can just see how big of a jump this device is over the 4. If we take a closer look at those triggers as well and the bumpers, yeah, these are both really nice. Another nice thing about ARM handhelds in general is they can be a lot thinner. These x86 handhelds are pretty thick and as a result they do tend to weigh a lot more. I'll leave the weights of all these handhelds on the screen so you can kind of get a sense of where they sit. As far as the build quality goes, the plastic on this feels really solid. This also feels slightly heavier than the 3 Plus, and it definitely is, but not by much. This also gives this device a way better quality feeling to it. I almost found the 3 Plus too light. There's a nice texture on the back, and the vent opening here looks pretty cool. I gotta admit though, the entire design in this red looks phenomenal. As far as transparent plastics go, I don't like it too transparent because you see a lot of the manufacturing lines and it just makes it look too cheap. The dark plastic hides a lot of that, but you can still see all the electronics underneath. Retroid also moved their branding to the back of the device, and I think this was a really smart design choice. The joysticks and the face buttons all feel very high quality. I do like how they've stuck with the rubber membrane face buttons. I really think it was a smart idea to bring this joystick upgrade forward from the 2S. The start and select are a clicky, but they're not too clicky. Let's take a closer look at what these sound like. I do find the ergonomics on this pretty decent, especially for D-pad centered games, but if you're using the joysticks, if you're holding it like this, your thumbs are going to have to be kind of squished down and it's not very comfortable. You almost have to position your hands further down to use them. However, I did buy the grip as I play a lot of Dreamcast on this, and I'm pretty happy with the grip on the 3 Plus, so I'm expecting similar results on the grip for the RP4. If you're playing this for D-pad games only, you're going to be really happy. That being said, even if you move your hands down slightly, using the joysticks isn't all that bad. Let's do a quick startup test between these two units. This is using EMMC storage, which is significantly slower than the UFS 3.1 on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. I'm going to press the button at exactly the same time just to see which one starts up quicker. Let's give the test a go and see what happens. Even though I pressed the button at exactly the same time, the interesting thing is this one took an extra second to start up. The Retro Pocket 3 Plus seems to be starting up quicker, but I still think this one's going to finish first. And there you go. So this one is quicker, but there was that delay when pressing the power button. Overall though, both of these start up pretty decently quick, so I don't really see any issue with that. First things first, let's get the elephant out of the room. Well, these two devices have exactly the same panel. You can see though that these two screens look vastly different. Taking a look at the interface for the RP4 Pro though, I've gone ahead and installed Daiji Show on this device. Everything feels very peppy, and this does actually feel a lot smoother than the interface did on the Retro Pocket 3 Plus. Not to say that that unit was bad at all, but this just feels way more snappy. 
Everything in here just loads, and when it loads, it loads quick. If I want to load anything up, all I have to do is click on it, and it should start almost instantaneous. On my Wi-Fi here at home, I'm getting 360 to 432 megabytes per second over my Wi-Fi 5 gigahertz. This is also connected to Wi-Fi 6. This is definitely the best case scenario for your Wi-Fi speeds. If you're looking to do some streaming on this, I think you'll be pretty happy, but we'll take a closer look at that later. The only tweaks that I've done to my device is I've gone to the battery options and I've gone down and turned off the battery saver. Under the battery manager, I've also shut this off. Generally on Android, when you have things like that, managing background processes and stuff to optimize things, they do more harm than good. So I've shut those both off. I also like to view the battery percentage in the top bar here, so I've enabled that too. I still have lots of storage space left on my unit. The rumble does feel a lot better on this unit compared to the 3 plus in the display settings i do have that brightness set to 100 percent as mentioned i also turned on my dark theme and you can also shut off the screensaver as of making this video i'm currently on the latest software update since i'm only using 2 gigs of ram out of 8 gigs total you can tell they're definitely using a very bare bone version of android Android tends to optimize the memory usage depending on how much there is, so you might notice slightly higher depending on future updates, but for now I'm only using 2 out of 8. In the handheld settings, there's a few things that you can change in here. Clean processes went on standby, I shut that off. I also left the background process limit to standard limit. Under the TV settings, I do have checked to turn off the handheld console screen when it's connected to the TV but on both the docks that I've tested, this does not work. I've already let Retroid know about this, so hopefully they'll fix this in a future software update. I've changed the L2 and R2 to both on the input settings. This will allow me to use the triggers in Daiji's show to navigate the interface. I've also enabled Google Play services. With handhelds this fast, I really don't think that we need to shut this off to get decent performance, and you're not gonna notice any differences by shutting this off. I don't really like doing internet speed tests as everyone's gonna have a different internet plan. However, I'm getting 1.5 gigabytes per second download speed here at home, so we can take a quick look at how this is gonna reflect to real internet speeds. And we're getting 418 megabytes per second download speed. I'm getting really low jitter, which means I got a very solid connection. I got 11 ping, and my download speed is 418 megabytes per second, with an upload of 162. This tells me that I am capping out my upload speed, but I could triple my download speed. However, for an Android device, 418 ain't bad. Next, I want to take a closer look just to see how quick the internal storage is. So I'm going to do a quick test on the internal memory, and we'll see what kind of results we're getting. This test takes a couple minutes, so we'll come take a look at this once it's done testing. The internal storage performed pretty decently, with reads averaging around 460 megabytes per second and writes averaging 240 megabytes per second. This is really decent, and I'm happy to see UFS storage finally in Retroid devices. After a quick test on the RAM, you can see that it tops out at 46,000 megabytes per second. This is really impressive. All in all, I'm pretty happy with the internals that they used on this new device. The speakers on this handheld aren't too bad either. I would put them on par with the 2S, and I gave that device pretty high praise when I reviewed it for the speakers. Let's take a closer look and see what these sound like.
so the Retroid Pocket 4 doesn't have bad speakers, not by any means, and they definitely sound better in real life over a recording. If I had to compare this to other speakers, those ones that I just showed you, this is how I'd rank them. At the very bottom of the list, I would put the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. The speakers are decent, but they're definitely not amazing by any regards. These ones did sound slightly tinny and there wasn't not a lot of bass to them. I would say the Retroid Pocket 4 does have better speakers than the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, but they still lack a little bit of bass to them. Even with the hi-fi mode on, there's still nothing to write home about, but they are really nice speakers. Moving up from there, I would say that the speakers on the Retroid Pocket 2S are much better, and this could also be due to the fact that they're front-facing. The Retroid Pocket 2S does sound slightly cleaner, but they're both really decent speakers. The Odin does have much better speakers, and they get way louder overall. If you're looking for pretty decent speakers though, I don't think the speakers on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro are bad by any means. But I can take a closer look at the speakers on the Retroid Pocket 4 when that one arrives. Being significantly more expensive than the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, I definitely hope that they would have better speakers, and they definitely do. But I don't think you're going to be disappointed with the speakers on any of these devices, they all sound pretty good to me. Next up, let's talk about the panel, and I don't think this is a bad panel by any means. We've seen this panel before in the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and the Retroid Pocket 3. Out of all the companies and handhelds that I've tried, Retroid has always put good screens into their devices. The colors look very saturated and it's very vibrant. The panel itself is also very bright. I'll have to take a closer look at this panel more once they do that update. One of the last things that I want to talk about is the performance. This device definitely hits better with performance than I expected it would. A lot of these lower end systems like Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, Sega Genesis, Nintendo 64, Nintendo DS, NES, the NES, PSP, and the SNES. A lot of these systems are going to run absolutely no issues whatsoever. We've hit a point with handhelds that we're actually throwing more power than we really need. Even a lot of these mid-tier systems like Dreamcast will run no issues whatsoever. But let's take a closer look starting with Dreamcast and working our way up from there. I knew that it would perform well. I didn't think it would perform this well though. This is Sonic Adventure 2 running on Dreamcast with the Flycast Core. And we're getting a solid 60 FPS at 1440p. If we look here, the GPU is in its middle state at 755 megahertz. If we bump that up to the high performance mode though, that can go up to 836 megahertz. We could upscale this even more, so let's try 4K. With this bumped up to 4K, we're getting around 45 FPS. This is with the high performance mode on, and it's still very playable. We're obviously capping out our GPU though, but it is amazing to see this running at 4K. If you remember from my Odin review, I did try 8K on the Odin 2, and I was getting very similar FPS in the mid 40s to 50s. But for $199, this is incredible. Dreamcast will definitely run at 1080p, and you're going to be able to get 1440p as well. Definitely on a lot of games anyways. Dreamcast is going to work really well. Pokemon Omega Ruby seems to work really well at 3x. This is really smooth, and I'm not getting any frame drops. Even with being on the overworld, we're actually still getting 60fps solid. This is looking to largely depend on the game you're playing, but for me anyways, this game seems to work really well on the Dimensity 1100. I'm pretty sure 3DS is not going to cause this chip any issues. Switching things over to GameCube, I initially did get some issues with the graphics. For some reason, it looked like everything was kind of blanked out, but this is the issue with using Dimensity chips. This is using Vulkan, but we can swap over to OpenGL to see if that fixes the issue. Let's give that a try and see if that fixes the problem. As you can see, once we swap over to OpenGL, we don't have any issues. Even running at 1080p, I'm getting a solid 60fps. I did not actually expect this to run as good as it is, but it's great to see how well this works. 1080p Pocket GameCube sounds pretty good to me. Of course, this is largely going to depend on the game you're playing, so you're going to have to test a few different games to see where they fall. 
1080p with OpenGL though seems to work pretty good in my testing. And the panel looks really good with these vibrant colors in here too. Overall I'm really happy so far with this device. I think this is really incredible for $199. With PS2, Shadow of the Colossus seems to run almost decently at 2x with OpenGL, but Vulcan didn't work at all. You're going to have to drop this down to probably 1x, maybe 1.5x to get some decent frame rates. It's pretty incredible to see this running on the Retroid Pocket 4 anyways, as this did not run at all on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. Let me drop that down to see if we can get some playable frame rates. Switching this into high performance mode actually gets this playable though. This lets that GPU clock max all the way out, so it really depends which kind of performance mode you want to play in. Shadows of the Colossus is getting a flawless 30 FPS at 2x, and this is pretty standard across all the PlayStation 2 games that I've tried. However, you are going to notice that the CPU temperature is getting up to 95 to 96 degrees Celsius, so this is getting pretty warm. If you're looking at the GPU load itself, it is only going up to about 40 to 50, so we definitely have a lot of GPU headway. This has always been a hard game to run anyways, so I didn't expect this to run at all. This is pretty impressive. I might take a look down the road at some cooling solutions to see if we can change the thermal pace to see if we can get that temperature dropping ever so slightly. This chip still has a little ways to go before it starts throttling though, so we should be okay. I don't personally emulate PS2 on my handhelds, but it was interesting to see what this thing was capable of. Every single game that I tested so far, with the exception of this one, ran at 2x. If you're looking for a good handheld that'll run PlayStation 2 flawlessly, I think you'll be pretty happy here. You are going to find some problematic titles though, and not every game is going to run, but usually those games don't run well on anything. Yuzu is a bit of an interesting one, so I've tried a couple games. The only games that I can get to work were Skull the Hero Slayer and Sonic Mania. Persona 4 Golden came close, and I'm pretty sure I could get that one working as well. I also haven't tested Hollow Knight, but I'm pretty sure that one would work too. Anything with semi-3D graphics like Octopath Traveler, or even Hades just wouldn't run. And at the highest end, Astral Chain and the new Pokemon Snap just didn't even come close to running. In the Yuzu settings, one of the reasons why these don't work very well is because there is no driver available for these GPUs. This shows us that custom drivers are not available for this device. This is one reason why Switch emulation works so well on the Odin 2 is there is custom drivers for it. However, even without that GPU driver, you can still get a lot of games working, but just temper your expectations. I did also play around with the graphic options, and it seems to handle those light indie titles fine at 720p. You could also enable FXAA, this doesn't seem to phase the GPU at all. The only other thing that I've enabled is the disk shader cache. In the debug options, I was trying the NCE backend. Unfortunately, I can't show any footage of these as these were purchased digitally on my Switch. So if you're looking for some light indie titles to play, I definitely think this is possible on this device. As mentioned though, just temper your expectations, and if you're looking for something like Hollow Knight or Skull the Hero Slayer, you could probably do that on this device, no issues. One of the best Android games that I've ever tried is Titan Quest. If I go to the graphic options, even if we max out all the graphic options, this is not a problem at all for the Retro Pocket 4 Pro. And once things load in, we are still getting that solid 60 FPS. This is also a full PC port, so this is definitely good value if you're looking for a fun game to play on Android. The graphics look really good, and the screen is really vibrant. You can see on the on-screen display that we're only using 25-30% to of our GPU. If you've never played Titan Quest before, it's very similar to Diablo, and I definitely recommend trying it. I originally played this game through many times on my PC, but the controls that they've done with this port are amazing. It actually feels like it was made for the controller, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Switching things over to the heaviest thing that I've run on this, one of the things that surprised me the most was how well it ran Genshin Impact. I got this locked to 60 FPS, and the graphics look great. I did actually have to use the on-screen display mapper, but that's pretty easy to turn on. If you don't have the side menu bar, the easiest way to turn that on is to swipe down. Then on the second screen, you're going to notice a floating icon. You can swipe this over, so that's on the second screen. Just make sure that's turned on. Once we've enabled that, 
you're going to see that the screen mapping tool is on. Then click on the key adapter. Then all we have to do is drag these over and assign them. So drag over the left joystick like this. The easiest way to remove something if you already have it, since I have the left joystick already, is to simply hold it down and drag it up to the top. We can move this anywhere on the screen, so I'm going to put that right there as that's where I would use my finger to move the left joystick. The right joystick, I've gone ahead and moved that one down here. Then you want to click on that. Make sure to click Adjust View Mode. Then click Save. To turn on these phase buttons, just drag this one down and put that over here to where the buttons would go. Then tap on these and assign them to the button that you're looking for. When you're done, click the blue box and you're going to notice it works fine. I've got this only running in the performance mode at the current moment, but I do have the render resolution set to high. These are my other settings. I also have the FPS turned on to 60 and motion blur shut off. If we want to max out those settings, we do need to turn it on to high performance mode. Just for testing's sake, I've gone ahead and turned everything to the absolute max. And this is still running at almost a solid 60 FPS. We're getting a few FPS tips, but for the most part, this is still extremely playable. Interestingly enough, the GPU isn't maxing out either, so this is pretty cool to see. I never thought I would see Genshin running on max settings on a handheld this size. To put in the perspective, even the Loki Zero cannot run this game at all. That was also with the device using the same resolution as what this one is using. And that one was struggling to get 20 to 30 FPS. This is maxed out, however, at nearly 60 FPS perfectly. To test streaming, I'm going to use Steam Link. I'm going to use the Enhanced 1080p preset and I'm going to go down to Customize. I'm going to leave the video quality and all this just to what it is. However, on the second page, I am going to drop the bandwidth limit down to 25 megabits per second. I'm going to leave the frame rate limit to 60 FPS. And for the resolution limit, I'm going to drop that down to 720p. Make sure to turn on HEVC video. This is going to half your bandwidth requirements for streaming. Make sure to also turn on low latency networking. But with all that done, let's go in and let's test it out. I did want to test this on the ROG Ally as I know this device has a really good Wi-Fi connection. The ROG Ally is connected to my 6GHz band on my Wi-Fi 6E. This is connected to my 5GHz band on my Wi-Fi 6. You can tell though that there is almost no latency whatsoever. As soon as I click it on the screen, it immediately reacts. I personally can't see any latency between these two devices, so this is remarkable. The metrics are down here and they're pretty small, so let me zoom in for you. From the metrics, you can see, yeah, we're running this at 1080p using HEVC. The streaming latency is extremely low. We have around 17 milliseconds on the display latency. We're getting around 6 milliseconds for our direct connection with our ROG Ally. We're also experiencing no packet loss whatsoever, basically, so this is really good for streaming. Overall though, if you're looking to stream, I definitely give the Retroid Pocket 4 my seal of approval. When testing the thermals on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, I loaded back up the PS2 emulator because this got the device hotter than anything else. We're sitting at around 85 degrees Celsius, and I want to see what kind of temperatures that we're looking at. On the front, the One controller is currently sitting at 28 degrees Celsius. On the other side, we're looking at around 30 degrees Celsius or around 87 degrees Fahrenheit. If we flip over to the back of the unit, we are currently sitting at around 32 on the sides, or around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It looks like the hottest part on the back is near the exhaust at 40 degrees Celsius. I can't find a single spot on the back that gets hotter than 40. This is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I do also find that my hands are getting a little clammy, but it's only at around 32 degrees Celsius, so that's not really that bad. There are also still a couple other things that I wanted to take a closer look at, namely being the battery. I do need to charge this up as it's currently only at 10% battery life and I've been testing a lot of heavy games lately. So I'm going to charge this up and we'll take a closer look at the battery life. For all the battery testing, I wanted to keep all the settings consistent, so I set the brightness to 80%. I turned on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and I left all these tests for half an hour. Then I calculated how much battery drain it did in 30 minutes and calculated it up to see how long it would last with a full charge. 
When testing the battery life, the first thing that I wanted to do was to see how long it could last. I went ahead with my default switch is the performance mode with smart fan on. This got 8 hours and 18 minutes of battery life, which is still actually pretty decent. However, if you remember from my Odin 2 test, the Odin 2 got 25 hours of battery life. I dropped the mode down to the standard mode, but I left the fan on the smart mode. This got us the same battery life at 8 hours and 18 minutes. However, I thought it would be interesting to try, so I disabled the fan and I was shocked to see we got an additional 4 hours of battery life. This brought the grand total for the best battery life score that I could get on this device to 12 hours and 30 minutes. Moving up from there, I thought we could look at a few different gaming situations. So we have the original red test, which I just described, and that gets up to 12 and a half hours. Stepping things up from there, we can look at Sonic Adventure 2. Running that at 1080p on the RetroArch Core got 6.5 hours of battery life. For Titan Quest, I got 5.5 hours. This actually matched the GameCube results that I tested as well. If you're looking to get GameCube on here, you're looking at around 5.5 hours too. Genshin Impact was a step down, but even with high quality settings, I was able to get 2 hours and 17 minutes. This was pushing the settings as high as I could while maintaining 60fps. The lowest battery life that I got was with PS2, and that went down to an hour and 40 minutes with Devil May Cry 3. This was using OpenGL at 1.5 times resolution upscaling to get a solid 60fps. Just a side note as well, I was actually experiencing worse battery life as opposed to my friend who was getting upwards of 50% better battery life on PlayStation 2. I'm not sure why, but our other results did vary slightly as well within 20%. I believe the battery in my unit might be slightly calibrated wrong. I'm going to reach out to Retroid for a replacement just to see if I can get any better battery life. Regardless, my friend was able to get up to 3-4 to four hours of battery life on PlayStation 2 depending on the game and the upscaling. All in all, this is some pretty impressive battery life. One question that I've been getting a lot of is do docks work with the Retroid Pocket 4? And yeah, they really do. Every single dock that I've tried for the Retroid Pocket 4 has worked absolutely no issues at all. Let me show you a couple different docks and how they fit with the Retroid Pocket 4. The Ioneo Multistation dock is currently my favorite dock. This works well on the Odin 2 and the Loki device as well as all the other Ioneo handhelds. However, this does work well with the Retroid Pocket 4 too. First, go ahead and make sure to line up the USB port. This is kind of hard to show off, but there is a small gap behind the device that goes between the device and the dock. If you put this onto the dock, immediately you're going to see a signal on your TV. You do have to find something to prop behind this to hold this up, otherwise it will lean the USB connection on this dock is designed to bend, but I personally don't like it bending that much. So if you do have this dock, it will work, but you are probably going to have to find something to prop it up. You could use a small eraser, or you could stick a small piece of plastic or something else behind there to hold it up. The other dock that I can recommend is the Skull & Co dock for the Nintendo Switch. There's a small post down here that you do have to take out. To get that out, all you have to do is prop this up. Then all you have to do is just pull this off, and that comes off really easy. Luckily there is less of a gap on this one, so if you're looking to get a dock, this is probably the one that I would recommend. This one also works flawlessly with this device, so as soon as you connect it, it'll show up right away on your TV. I've also seen a lot of people ask if the 3 Plus case fits for the new RP4. At least this one, it does. This is only slightly thicker than the Retro Pocket 3 Plus, so it still has lots of room. The only aftermarket case that I have found that fits with this is the Spigen Switch Lite case. This is a really high quality case, so if you're looking for something that fits it and you want to get it on Amazon, this is the way I'd go. With this one, however, you do have to flip the unit upside down. The two triggers fit into this groove and they stop it from sliding around. That closes nice and it looks good. This is probably the case that I'll use for this, but I do have the official one on the way as well. The good thing about these new joysticks that they're using, it also means that we can use some nice grips for them. Skull & Co came out with some ones for the Switch that fit really well on here. 
once I go ahead and pop that on, you can see it's not interfering with the range of the joystick at all. This also adds quite a lot of height to the top and it feels a lot better to use. If you're using the joysticks a lot, I definitely recommend picking these up. Do I think that the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is worth it at $199? Absolutely. This is a great handheld, it's built really well. There's a lot to like about this handheld and I think a lot of people are going to be very happy. This instantly replaces the 3 Plus. And I genuinely think that this is going to be the best handheld for under $200 for quite some time. We have some nice face buttons on it. We have these awesome joysticks. By far, I can tell that this is the best plastic that Retroid has used on a handheld. I even brought this to work in minus 35 Celsius and it did not crack at all. It's definitely certified for a nice cold Canadian winter. I also love these new triggers and the design on them is a welcome improvement. This little flare on the end and the nice texture on them makes them a lot easier to use. I didn't touch on the fan noise in this review as there's going to be an update very soon so I don't want to have to go through testing this just to figure out that it's been changed in a week. Once that update hits, if you guys are interested, I can revisit the fan to take a look at it. Smart and quiet mode both don't seem to bother me. I think that new fan curve will definitely improve this. I also love how we have a full-fledged USB-C port. This allows us to do full video out and opens the capabilities for many different accessories, especially a lot of these nice docks. I've tried these Retroid devices before with the texture, but the texture on this one just feels more premium to me. Retroid has already released an update for this device fixing the screen, and I can tell you right away, this screen looks absolutely incredible. With the new update, there is absolutely no issues with the color accuracy, and everything looks very vibrant and bright. All in all, I definitely recommend the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. If you're using this for old systems like Genesis, Nintendo 64, DS, NES, you'll be really happy. PSP works great. There are some negatives though. Obviously you're not going to get perfect Switch emulation and anything that you're going to get running is just going to be a bonus at this point. I was only able to find two games that ran because we just don't have the driver support for Nintendo Switch yet. 3DS seems to work well though and I don't think you're going to have any issues with that. We can essentially do any emulation available to Android on this device. Nintendo GameCube gave me 5.5 hours of battery life. This was even running 2 to 3x on some games. So I am pretty impressed with the battery life, all things considered. It's an extremely efficient chip and the active cooling is pretty quiet. If you're using the high performance mode, you will notice the fan, but if you're using the smart or the quiet fan modes, I don't think they'll bother you. What do you guys think of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro? Let me know in the comments below. Did you pick one up and what color did you pick? If you have any questions regarding the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, make sure to let me know in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and as always, thanks for watching.